we start recording? Okay, let me move this out of the way. Okay, um, so it should be recording now. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys were able to take a look at those practice questions and maybe you're kind of waiting until you've covered everything to let it be um, just something to test your knowledge. Some of them are definitely simpler than what you'll see on the test, but I actually tried to match the difficulty from what I remember and then try to put together questions that I remember from my own test. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully it's helpful. Um, Dr. Jones, you guys haven't had her before. You'll only have her for neuro. Um, her questions are really nice because they're what you expect. Um, so if she emphasizes something or says to be aware of something, you can sort of expect that to be tested. Her test questions, I would say, are much more straightforward and kind of to the point. Dr. Grow, which kind of teaches sort of histology, I guess you could call it. His stuff is a lot more tricky. I would say when it came to like testing, I always felt a little bit more confused when it came to his stuff. So um, just kind of for you to be aware of that. I'm gonna move that out of the way. Um, but I'll kind of go through, like I said, and point out things. So I have the chat pulled up um, just right here for myself. So if you have any questions or want me to go back over something, just let me know. So we're going to go through lectures one through five. So we will stop with, not this one, this one. So we'll stop with biochemistry of the brain, I believe it is. Yes. And that kind of leaves the remaining um, Dr. Viejo's lectures, which she's kind of has her own way of testing as well. So, but we'll get going with Dr. Jones stuff. Um, so a lot of this is very introductory to kind of remind you of how the nervous system is broken up. So I'm sure you, you've seen this before. This isn't anything necessarily new, but of course you have your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. But it is really, really important that you keep these things very clear and defined. Um, because we get to such a detailed, small level when we're talking about the nervous system that you do, you do really have to keep these separate. So just a reminder, brain and spinal cord is your CNS. Basically, everything else is your peripheral nervous system. And then starting to really become very comfortable with these divisions is going to help you a ton, especially when you get to head and neck anatomy, because we really, they really, really hone in on these divisions. And you have to know, like, the specific fibers of cranial nerves um, associated with each of these branches. So try to really understand this now. So we have a somatic, which I just typically think of things that are more under our control versus visceral. This role is usually um, involuntary, so we don't have the ability to control it. With somatic, you have both motor and sensory. With the motor portion of things, just think of skeletal muscle, just like it says here. And then sensory is just like sensation. So sensation from maybe touching your skin or something like that. And then understanding these, um, the way information travels to and from the central nervous system is really important. So it always kind of goes from, uh, I guess, more medial to more lateral, if that makes sense. So um, your CNS, when we're talking about motor information, you've got the Motor information traveling from the brain and spinal cord out to the peripheral nervous system, out to your skeletal muscle to do some sort of action. But then the reverse happens if, let's say, you touch your arm. We have receptors on our arm that send messages to our peripheral nervous system back up to our central nervous system in order for some action to occur. Your visceral is a bit different. Um, kind of the biggest part of visceral, I would say, is when we get out to this branch in here. So visceral motor and then yeah, specifically when we talk about your autonomic nervous system or sympathetic and parasympathetic function. So this is just very, very introductory here. And then this is just another way of looking at it. Um, I'm trying to remember, hopefully you can see this. No, that doesn't want to work. Um, basically, the way I remember this is same. Maybe I'll type it in the chat. Same is the way that I remember afferent versus efferent. So S stands for sensory, A stands for afferent, M stands for motor, 
and E stands for efferent. So that's supposed to help you know that sensory is afferent, motor is efferent. I literally used that little um, mnemonic or whatever you want to call it for like all of neuro, just so that I it was easy and it was simple to remember. And you really have to keep afferent versus efferent straight. So if it is sensory afferent, that means it is coming from the peripheral nervous system to your central nervous system. If it's efferent or motor, we know that goes CNS to PNS. And then um, here's just another kind of uh, division of terms. You don't, I mean, you do, I guess I will say, you do need to memorize um, this information, but um, it becomes more relevant as she talks about more specific structures in the central nervous system. So you should know, like, out of these different categories, which would be considered peripheral nervous system versus central nervous system. Um, and then kind of as we get further on, it kind of makes a little bit more sense um, how to, I guess, uh, put these different things into categories. But definitely start learning these terms now. And then these next few slides are just all about directionality, which definitely take a little bit of time and make sure you're comfortable with the directionality of the brain and the different slices of the brain, because it is actually extremely important, especially as we continue on through the next couple exams, because a lot of the test is identification, but then not not just identifying, but then being able to say, this is what this is, and this is the function of this part of the brain, or this is the information that's being carried through this portion of the brain. So as much as you might want to skip over it, make sure you do get comfortable with right versus left and how it's reverse of what you expect and um, like anterior posterior, things like that. Okay. Same thing here. So the reason she's taking the time to break all of this up is because the brain is different than every other part of the um, body. So if we're talking about above the midbrain, we have rectal, caudal, dorsal, ventral, and then below the midbrain, it has its own different way of uh, labeling. So take some time, make sure you're comfortable with that. turn off my notifications so that doesn't bug you guys. Okay. Um, another just simplistic way of breaking down um, the nervous system, just in general, make sure you know that glia are typically considered supporting cells of the nervous system. We have glia for the central nervous system, which are astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and microglia. And then our Schwann cells are the main ones for the peripheral nervous system. Um, again, a lot of just terminology, a lot of anatomy. So just breaking down what a neuron is and what are the parts of a neuron. And yes, as maybe <laughs> annoying as it is to sit here and have to study it, definitely do it. So the soma is the cell body here. It's the metabolic center of the neuron. Then you have dendrites that are coming off of the soma that um, are able to receive some sort of signal coming into the soma and then this axon that has these thick bands of myelin is what actually is able to transmit the signal and down here it's transmitting it to some muscle and in this case it's a skeletal muscle. This is definitely important. So you have different types of neurons. Um, so we have pseudounipolar, bipolar, and multipolar. It's important to know the differences between them because depending on the type of sensory system we're talking about, it uses different neurons. So start memorizing this now. It might not be as testable on this test quite yet, but you will get there when she introduces cranial nerves. So pseudounipolar are specific to sensory systems, those both somatic and visceral and the gustatory system or taste. Bipolar is olfactory, which is uh, smell, visual, auditory, and vestibular. And then multipolar is motor systems. And I find it very easy to remember multipolar because you match up the M in multipolar with the M in motor systems 
I highly recommend as you're studying this neuro, make sure that you're creating little things to help you remember because there's a lot of detail here to remember. And then also she just mentions here that neurons can be further classified depending on the type of neurotransmitter they contain. So just remember that some neurons might release acetylcholine, which would make them cholinergic. So just another way to classify. This becomes important when we talk about the um, pathways for somatosensation or for pain or pain and touch pathway of the face. This is basically the, the main structural um, way that it's set up and the way that she's going to teach it. So typically you'll have your first neuron, which is a primary sensory neuron. So it's generally located in your periphery. The second neuron is usually a multipolar interneuron, and then the third is usually multipolar. And then lastly, we have the brain receiving the information. So this is just generally the way that it's set up. And um, the more of this detail that you can learn right now, the better, because I will tell you in neuro more so than any other section of BASI, you have to know the very little details. So like, the third neuron being in the thalamus. That is a detail you have to know. So make sure you're not skipping over these little things. Um, let me actually go back and point out something. So this example right here is if we were talking about somatosensation, which is just kind of your general sensation from skin. Um, this would be the scenario if we were talking about um, the neural pathway for motor systems. So remember that if we're trying to send a signal to a muscle to, let's say, contract, it goes from your central nervous system to your peripheral nervous system, which are these neurons, to your skeletal muscle. And then you're going to have multipolar type neurons. And then, of course, it's for motor. Typically, there are only two neurons associated. Um, and this is giving you an example of the cortical spinal tract, which you probably have no idea what that means yet, which is totally fine because I don't think that comes up until the second exam. So this is just all very introductory to help you start learning how these things are divided. So you should be aware of the functions of astrocytes. Astrocytes are a very, very hugely important cell in the CNS. So it's one of those glia, like I said, the glia is a supporting cell of the central nervous system. The main ones are astrocytes oligodendrocytes, and microglia. Um, astrocytes play a huge important role when it comes to your blood-brain barrier and actually being part of creating the blood-brain barrier. So one function is structural support. You also have the glia limitans, which is another barrier that you find between the pia mater, which is one of the meningeal layers of the brain and the CNS. It helps in metabolic support, which I think we talk about a little bit later with astrocytes and um, in a couple uh, lectures. And then it's also important for injury response. So it can create scars if, for whatever reason, the brain is damaged. Oligodendrocytes, the only function you should be aware of for this is that they myelinate our axons in the CNS, whereas Schwann cells myelinate axons in the PNS. Make sure you've got those straight. And then microglia, they kind of have a lot of different functions. One of them is immune surveillance. So they kind of work as like sort of an immune system for the brain in some ways. And then also they're important for injury response and they can phagocytize things that we don't need. So maybe necrotic tissue and things like that. And this is more anatomy. So just breaking it down between all the different sections of the brain. Of course, you have your main brain and that's mostly composed of your cerebral hemispheres and then your diencephalon which is this structure right here. Um, and then you have your brainstem and your cerebellum, cerebellum here, brainstem here, and then of course the brainstem continues on into the um, spinal cord. Um, I don't know, I wouldn't say that necessarily like knowing the exact numbers here is going to be something that you tested on, but I think you've learned this before, and I'm pretty sure that I gave you guys my little thing to help me remember. I think of what times we eat meals normally, 8, 12, and 5. So breakfast at 8, lunch at 12, 5 is dinner, just to help me remember 
how many um, spinal uh, nerves you have for each of these sections of the spinal cord. This is definitely important and I think it's talked about later, but to the regions of L1 and L2 is where your conus medullaris is, which is this portion down here, where basically you don't have spinal cord anymore, you just have these um, spinal nerves floating in the cerebral spinal fluid. And then S2, which is uh, talking about your sacral region, that's the end of the dural sac, so the very end of where the spinal cord basically is. So these next sections, um, my best recommendation, and this is exactly how I studied this section, is basically, let me get to the thing. And with these slides here, she probably said it, you don't need to have it memorized yet, but I think it's by the next exam you will. So I would go ahead and start memorizing some of this. The way that I approached that is I threw this into some type of flashcard. Um, Quizlet is perfectly fine to use. You can even throw it into your own PowerPoint. And then what you should do is blank out each of these words so that the next slide you have to say, like it'll show you what the correct answer is so that you can test yourself. So that's what I did for all of this. And I just right away started learning every single thing on here because at some point or another, it's relevant in all of this neuro stuff. But particularly what you do have to know for this exam is you have to be able to, if given a slice of the brainstem, be able to say what section of the brainstem it is, or you might be given a section of the brainstem like this, you'd need to know that it's caudal medulla, for example, and then she might be having, she might have this portion identified and you'd have to be able to say it's your um, gracile tubercle. So best tip I can give you for studying this, again, throw this into some type of flashcard, PowerPoint, block out what's labeled and test yourself until you have it memorized. I don't know if there's any other way to do it because if you don't actively test yourself on these brainstem sections, I promise you, you will be lacking because even if you just sit here and look at it for a really long time, um, it's not the same as testing yourself to ensure that you definitely know it. So make sure that you take the time and you do that because um, like I said, there's no way to know if you know it without testing yourself. So for all of these different sections, that's what I would do. And like I said, the way the questions are going to be, you'll see exactly this, for example. She'll give you this um, slice. She won't have the words labeled, but she might point to something. So perhaps she'll point to the hypoglossal nerve here, or perhaps she'll point to the olive or the pyramid or whatever, and then you'll need to be able to identify that. For this section of the test, it'll be more just identification because there comes a point where each of these different sections on the brainstem is carrying different information from different pathways. And we'll get into that more when we get there, but the, you basically need to learn this and keep this until neuro is done. So I would highly recommend Make a really nice flashcard deck for yourself, PowerPoint, whatever, and then start reviewing this. And don't stop after the exam is done. Continue to review these sections because it's going to help you hugely once we get to the pathways. So I'm just going to kind of go through these. Um, that's my best. That's literally all I did to study these. There was nothing more to it. I just knew I needed to see it. And I studied the like flashcard deck I made for myself um, every day. And for me, I just did it once a day um, because I felt like that was ample. And if you feel like that's enough for you, then just do it once a day and you'll probably be totally fine. So as far as this test goes, it's gonna be more identification. And you will not get a picture. So you won't get this picture slicing it for you, showing exactly what section of the brainstem you're in you'll only be getting the slice of the brainstem. So that's where you really have got to pair these two images together in your mind and be able to envision what section you're in. And that just truly comes from repetition. Um, the parts that I would say are testable here 
make sure you know the functions of both the thalamus and the hypothalamus. I kind of uh, skimmed over this a little more than I should have, and there was a test question where you had to identify out of a list, which I think was not a function of the hypothalamus. So make sure you know the functions here. And then let's say she gives you this picture on the exam. She maybe puts a label on the thalamus and then asks you a question about its function, or she might say something about the hypothalamus and then ask you what is one of the functions or what is not one of the functions. Um, same thing with these images of the brain. Um, I would go ahead, not that you necessarily have to know all of these parts yet, but I would go ahead and take some time and create yourself a really nice PowerPoint deck or flashcard deck, black, uh, black out the labels, and then on the next slide have it so that you can see what the correct answer is, and do this with the brain as well, because you will have to know all of these things that are labeled on the brain. I think for this test, what you need to be aware of so far is the lobes of the brain. So your frontal lobe, parietal, temporal, um, and then occipital, and then your limbic lobe is in the inside. So you can't see this externally. You would have to um, hemisect the spheres to open it up to see the um, limbic lobe. So that's all you really have to know right now, but it doesn't hurt to get ahead. Now, where you do have to start knowing the detail, and I wish I could tell you guys that none of this was important, but unfortunately it is, is for each of these lobes, you need to know the associated gyrus. Um, or gyri, because again, it may not seem super important yet, but in lectures and exams to come, it will be. So for each of these lobes, um, and you could even, for those of you guys, for those of y'all that have maybe iPads, you could always take this colored image that has the lobes colored off nicely for you, and then you could basically merge this picture with this one so that you can write out all of the gyrus or gyri that are on the brain, but then you can see colored nicely the different sections of the lobes, and that might be a little bit easier to study, because you do need to know, like I said, each one of these, for frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, what are the different gyri associated with each? And then this definitely was a, there was a test question on the first test that I, I think I barely got right um, because this was another thing I skimmed is I skimmed the functions, excuse me, of the different lobes thinking, oh, I'll remember this. This is super easy. Well, um, I believe the function it was talking about was like which of the following is a function of the temporal lobe. And I believe learning and memory was the correct answer. But then it had like language production. Then it had cog uh, cognition and language processing, and then I think vision. So I was like, okay, I know vision is wrong because that's with the occipital lobe. But then I was really having a tough time trying to figure out what was correct for the temporal lobe because some of these sound super familiar. So make sure you know the functions of each lobe. Um, that could be a really easy test question for you to get correct. Okay, so this next section talks about the different meningeal layers that are found on both the brain and the spinal cord. So let's see if we can kind of zoom up. Hopefully this is zoomed up. But the layer that is closest to either the brain or the spinal cord is your pia mater. The one that's in the middle is your arachnoid mater. And the last one is your dura mater. That's the one that's very fibrous. Um, it's almost like a capsule around the brain and the other meningeal layers. And then this is showing you, this would be one hemisphere of the brain, another hemisphere of the brain, and then these are the layers. So this green one is the pia mater that's very intimately connected with the different sections of the brain. Arachnoid mater looks very vascular here, and then dura mater is this fibrous gray one. So you should know from either outside to inside or inside to outside the layers of the um, meninges. And in general, what do they do? Probably pretty easy to figure that out. They surround and they protect the central nervous system. So they provide multiple different barriers and layers so that the brain isn't in direct contact with the skull. 
or the spinal cord is in indirect contact with the vertebral column. Um, and then this goes into a little bit more um, with the sinuses, which are important for cerebral spinal fluid drainage. Um, so for your cranial dura, so this is the dura mater basically here, you can see that there are two different layers to it. So we have a periosteal layer. Peri means around, osteal means bone. So it's intimately connected with the skull. So it's fused to the internal aspect of the skull. And then you have your meningeal layer. As you can imagine, the meningeal layer of the dura mater is connected to the other meninges of the brain. So the, the meningeal layer of the dura mater is right up against the arachnoid mater. And then for, you'll hear this a lot, there's this talk of real spaces versus potential spaces. And I'm sure they talked about it. A real space is something that's actually there in normal anatomy. And then a potential space is an area where infection, inflammation, things that shouldn't normally be there can travel into and make it into a space. So the dural venous sinus is a space that's actually there. Um, and it's formed when the meningeal layer detaches from the periosteal layer, has a lot of venous blood in it. And then we have these little dural reflections where the meningeal layer folds back on itself. And then lastly, in the spinal cord, you have spinal dura. And the difference between the spinal dura versus the cranial dura is spinal dura does not break up into two layers. You only have one layer. It does not have any sinuses and there are no reflections. So it is important to understand the difference between spinal versus cranial. And there's a lot of talk of the difference between the CNS of the spinal cord and the brain. And then lastly here, this is just showing you your folk cerebri is basically the meningeal or dural layer that partitions the two cerebral hemispheres. So you have the two halves, and this is basically traveling between the two halves. And then this goes into a little bit more about the different partitions. So the folk cerebri is this portion here. This is the dura mater that is making up pretty much all of these either folk cerebri or cerebelli. These are dural reflections, which just means it's portions of the dura mater. And then the tentorium cerebellum travels horizontally. So this is between the occipital lobe, if you could imagine it being right here, and then the cerebellum, which would be under what we're seeing here. And then this is now talking about our arachnoid layer. So remember, the dura is most exterior, or most external. And then the middle layer is your arachnoid layer. So this one also has two different layers to it. Um, the first layer is the arachnoid barrier layer. So that is right intimately connected with your dura mater. And then you have um, the trabecular layer, which, as you can see, it's forming like little trabeculations that's pretty noticeable. It's very vascular. It's very, it has a lot of vasculature. And like it says here, it contains cerebral spinal fluid and lots of blood vessels. And then here again, it's comparing cranial versus spinal. So in your spinal cord, the arachnoid layer has a barrier and a trabecular layer. So it does have two different layers that encloses um, the subarachnoid space, but there are no arachnoid villi. These right here are little arachnoid villi, which just help with um, basically putting um, or the creation of cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, and then the last layer is your pia mater. So um, with the pia mater, it's a single layer that invests the surface of both the brain and the spinal cord. So regardless of what location we're talking about, it is both just single layered and it is continuous with the arachnoid trabeculae. So it's there's no like real way to differentiate them. Um, things that you should know from this slide that could be testable, phylum terminale is composed of pia mater. So make sure you know that. I think we did have a test question on that that wanted us to be able to, I think it like had this image, had it uh, something labeling that 
last little tail portion, and then we were asked what meningeal layer makes up this structure. So you had to know it was the phylum terminale, and then you had to know that it was pia mater that extends from the inferior end of the spinal cord. And then the denticulate ligaments, um, just knowing what does that do in general, it anchors the spinal cord laterally. Um, so those are two important things to for sure know. And then I suppose in general, these are two things that are unique to the spinal cord. You don't find these in the brain. So denticulate ligament and phylum terminales only in the spinal cord. And then here's that I was talking about potential versus real space. So for sure, for the epidural, subdural, subarachnoid space, you should know which ones are potential spaces and which one are real spaces. So epidural is a potential space in the brain um, because there is not, don't think, don't uh, use this as a real space. This is the dural venous sinus. Um, when it's talking about epidural space, it's talking about like this section right here. That's a potential space because it's, the dura mater is intimately connected here. It's a real space in the spinal cord. So there is, let's see if we can find it. Yes, so right here, like all this fatty um, tissue and venous uh, structures here, that's all found in the epidural space. So it is a real space in the spinal cord. Subdural space is under the dura. So it's between the meningeal dura and the arachnoid barrier. That's also a potential space. Um, a little tip here, for each of these spaces, epidural, subdural, subarachnoid, you should know what basically are the two layers making up the space. So in the case of subdural, it's meningeal dura and arachnoid barrier layer. For epidural, it's endosteum of the skull and periosteal layer of the dura. The um, only one in the brain that's a real Space is the subarachnoid space. So this area right here that we already pointed out, it's very, has a lot of vasculature. So it's between the arachnoid barrier layer and the pia mater, and it has a lot of arachnoid trabecular cells that are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Um, I can pretty much guarantee to you that this will be on the test, either epidural or subdural. We had, I wanna say we had epidural. So just to give you an idea of how it might look on the test, you'll likely get this MRI here or CT scan of the brain and you'll see this right here, if of course it's epidural. So what you need to take away from this, for an epidural hematoma, you should know what is damaged to create it. So rupture of your middle meningeal artery, secondary to fracture of the temporal skull. So basically you should know that it's a middle meningeal artery that's damaged um, and that's what would create an epidural hematoma. And then you should know the deficits. So if they talked about in a clinical case, patient presents after, let's just say, maybe it was a baseball player, he suffered a blow to the side of his head, he experienced headache and confusion afterwards. Um, maybe you could, I think our test question read something like, he went to urgent care, they diagnosed him with a concussion, you know, he was fine, whatever. But then, he started to experience lethargy, he was talking just fine, and then he died. So basically that's what this talk and die means, that you could be talking just fine, be a little out of it and lethargic, and then the next second you could literally just pass out and die. So this is very common or very characteristic of epidural hematoma. And then for the CT or MRI, you're looking for lens shaped. So definitely one of these hematomas or the subarachnoid hemorrhage, one of these three will be on your test. So for subdural hematoma, what causes this? It's a tearing of cerebral bridging veins. So it's showing you here where those are. You have all these different veins that bridge across your cerebral hemispheres. Um, the typical person that this happens in, I don't know if it says it, doesn't look like it's saying it here. Typically this happens in like elderly people whose venous system is pretty, like the veins in their body are pretty friable and, um, not very strong. And so even just from like a fall where maybe they didn't necessarily hit their head, but there was a significant jolt that caused maybe their head to go back and then forward again is enough to cause shaking of the brain to tear these bridging veins. And so you would look for a crescent shape. So this here. So just to compare, this is more of a short moon shape, half moon shape. This is more of a crescent, very thin looking here. 
and that's how you would know that this is a subdural hematoma. Um, deficits, so this is interesting. It may be absent or may resemble an epidural hematoma. So basically, after this happens, um, you you might not even know that this person has this because they might not be experiencing any symptoms at that time. The difference here, typically with an epidural hematoma, it's you also get a fracture of the skull. So you would know pretty quickly if in the temporal region of the skull, if there was a fracture, you're, I mean, definitely you're gonna get a CT MRI and see if there is an epidural hematoma forming. And then this is just showing you where they took a drill into the skull to relieve the blood that was causing increased pressure. The risk here, really the risk for both, is that as you have fluid and blood build up in the skull, there's no place for the brain to go. There isn't like there's excess space in the skull for the brain. So it can cause both brain herniations um, or it can cause such elevated intracranial pressure that you can start experiencing irreversible neurological deficits. Lastly, subarachnoid hemorrhage. I kind of feel like this might have been on our test actually because of this. I sort of remember that being really important. So the difference with subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's commonly due to rupture of cerebral artery, um, typically associated with an aneurysm. So um, in the case of aneurysms, a lot of people can actually be born with congenital aneurysms and have no idea that they have it. And then at some point in life, it can rupture and can end up being fatal. The biggest thing in, the, in a question you're looking for is symptoms that a patient had a very sudden excruciating headache with maybe no history of trauma, and they're saying it's the worst headache of their life. They have neck sickness, stiffness or vomiting and nausea. And then, of course, on the MRI, there would be presence of blood within the CSF filled spaces. So the difference between um, this and the other types is on the MRI. It's not necessarily going to show you like a certain shape um, on the brain, whereas the other ones is like crescent and half moon. This one is just going to show you that there is blood in the area where CSF normally should be. And then I believe you do need to know the flow of cerebral spinal fluid um, through the ventricles. Um, I don't know how in depth she went with this. Let me see, I think in the other one. Yeah, this one shows the circulation. But in general, the function of the ventricles of the brain is it produces cerebral spinal fluid. Um, specifically by the choroid plexus within the ventricles. That's something that's definitely testable. This is just showing you all of the different ventricles in the brain. We have a right and left lateral ventricle. There's a third, fourth, and then these are the passageways that cerebral spinal fluid travel through between the different ventricles. So this kind of shows you here. You can't see the lateral ventricles because they're basically like pushed into the two different hemispheres. But the way it travels is you have um, cerebral spinal fluid created in the lateral ventricles, both left and right. Then that passes through the interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. And then that eventually passes through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. And then once you get to the fourth ventricle, you have your median aperture and your lateral aperture that continue to spread the cerebral spinal fluid. And then this is supposed to just help you know that for the median aperture, that's also called the foramen of mag magnity. And the lateral aperture is the foramina of Lushka. Um, other things to know here. So this is a good point. So cerebral spinal fluid does circulate in the subarachnoid space up to the superior sagittal sinus, where it leaves the um, subarachnoid space via arachnoid granulations to be reabsorbed into venous circulation. So to go back to this picture, basically the cerebral spinal fluid that's in this space will leave this space via these granulations to go into this venous circulation.
Um, I do believe we had a question on hydrocephalus. I don't remember if it was obstructive or non-communicating or the um, communicating. Basically, you just need to know what's the difference between non-communicating and communicating hydrocephalus. The big thing is, is where's the blockage? So for non-communicating, there's a blockage within the ventricular system. For communicating, the blockage is outside the ventricular system. And then what might cause it? So for non-communicating, it's usually caused by a tumor or some narrowing in that flow of cerebral spinal fluid, particularly at the cerebral aqueduct, which is right here. So narrowing would prevent the correct flow of cerebral spinal fluid causing a buildup of fluid in the brain. And then communicating, so the typical causes for that is there's an imbalance between the production of CSF and its reabsorption back into venous circulation. So perhaps for whatever reason, either the body is making too much CSF and it's not being reabsorbed quickly enough into venous circulation, or maybe it's making normal amount, and for whatever reason it can't get reabsorbed. Um, so the internal carotid system, so I think you guys already went through this anatomy, but you have your common carotid that comes off your um, aorta, which you can't really see here, but this is the common carotid, and then it bifurcates into um, an internal and an external. So external goes and supplies basically the entire face. Internal here travels, has basically no branches until it gets up into the brain. So that's what this is showing is the traveling up into the brain. Once it gets to the brain, it enters the skull and divides into anterior and middle cerebral arteries. So here, right here, this is the internal carotid artery. It's branching here into the middle and then here into the anterior cerebral artery. With again, with this stuff, I would throw it into your flashcards because um, that's going to be the easiest thing to remember. Same thing with your circle of Willis and um, all of this arterial supply of the brain. I would also throw this stuff into the flashcards. Um, so this is basically showing you the very bottom portion of the brain if you were to take the brain and flip it over. Um, so this is the brain stem right here. And then in green, you have your vertebral arteries, which come together and fuse into your basilar artery and then that branches into your posterior cerebral arteries. Honestly, again, easiest thing is just make these into flashcards. Um, you do for sure have to know if given an image, can you identify each of these things here? I think our test, we had to identify ICA. It was either ICA or PICA. I don't remember which one it was. I kind of am leaning towards ICA, but you should be able to identify each one of these. And then in general, you should be able to say, is it a branch of the basilar artery or is it a branch of the vertebral artery? This is not cooperating with me. And then this is just more on the circle of Willis. Technically, this portion right here is considered the circle of Willis. Um, the asterisk is the internal carotid artery. And then remember the internal carotid artery branches into the middle cerebral and anterior cerebral. This is the anterior communicating artery. This is the posterior communicating artery, posterior cerebral artery. So you just need to be able to um, identify it. That's the biggest thing. So. A lot of this lecture is just anatomy. Okay, I'm going to keep going here to the next lecture. Um, don't forget, there's the chat. So if you guys have questions, you can throw them in the chat. Okay, so this next section is neuroscience with Dr. Gro. Um, he is a little bit trickier with the way he tests um, because he's kind of like Dr. Lee and usually has multiple steps to his test questions. Um, and I personally, like, absolutely hate the way his lectures are set up. I just don't like that everything is bold. Like, I don't know. I'm just sort of picky with how I like lectures, and I don't love the way he set his up, but that's okay. I'll help try to point out what's important. Some of this should hopefully be some review from the first lecture. Just remember, you have different types of neurons, and they are in different locations. 99% of all neurons are um, multipolar neurons, but then you have pseudo-unipolar, you also have bipolar neurons. 
And then he specifically mentions some other locations of these neurons that Dr. Jones did not. So I would take note of that. For example, bipolar neurons you typically find in the retina of the eye, cranial nerve one, which is olfactory, and cranial nerve eight, which is vestibular cochlear. Um, nothing crazy important here. This is just basically going over um, the way that neurons look in the cerebral cortex and specifically talking about pyramidal cells. So if you saw an image like this that have these kind of pyramid shaped cells, that's what they are, they're pyramidal cells. And then this is showing you different slices of what Purkinje cells might look like. And I don't know if he gets into what Purkinje cells and pyramidal cells are until maybe next exam. So a lot of this test expects more anatomy identification than anything else. So probably my best recommendation is put this stuff in flashcards too, because the more that you're just going through and repeating, reviewing these slides, I think the easier it'll be for you to know what it's identifying. We already had kind of talked about the components of a neuron. Uh, but this goes into a little bit more detail. So we have the soma, and in the soma, you have the cell body, um, or it's also called the cell body. This is what you basically should know. So the cell body contains all of these things. So it contains nucleus, a nucleolus, missile body, Golgi complex, mitochondria, neurofilaments, and microtubules. The reason I say you should know that is because depending on the section of the neuron you're in, um, there are different things within it. Um, so for example, like your dendrites are not necessarily going to contain all of these same things. Um, and I'll show you here in just a few seconds what I mean by that. Now this is identifying uh, basically the different things that you find in the soma. So the nissel bodies are these small granule-like looking structures. The nucleolus is the very dense structure within the nucleus. And then these are uh, neuroglia nuclei. Um, yeah. Now with dendrites, dendrites don't have all of the same things as the cell body. So it contains the same organelles as the cell body, except a nucleus, um, except a nucleus. So that's super important. Um, and then only the nissel bodies and Golgi complexes are in proximal portions. So proximal means um, more close to the center. So these dendrites are these extensions off the cell body here. So basically in these sections that are closer to the soma, will you find nissel bodies and Golgi complexes? If you're in the distal portion, you won't find it. And dendrites don't have a nucleus. So make sure. That's basically what I mean by being able to differentiate these things. And then again, he's just... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Comparing pyramidal cells and Purkinje cells. We get into more of what these two different types of cells do, but Purkinje cells to me looks like a tree. Pyramidal cells look, I guess, sort of more like a pyramid. They're much smaller um, and more compact. So we have a soma, we have dendrites, and now we have the axon, which is this portion here that carries the information from the cell body to whatever the target is, and the axon has myelin. So this contains mitochondria, neurofilaments, microtubules, but no protein-making machinery. Um, I want to say that was on our test, the fact that axons do not have um, any ability to make proteins, but it does have neurofilaments and microtubules, which is important for structure and for um, some movement. And then what's important here is there are two different ways that information can travel on a neuron. Anterograde is what you would expect. Cell body information comes from the cell body, goes down the axon to, let's just say there's a muscle down here. Retrograde would be going from this little synaptic nodule up the axon to the cell body. The typical one you expect is anterograde, and it uses microtubules and kinesin. So you definitely need to know for each type of transport, what type of specialized protein does it use? Kinesin is a specialized protein. 
for retrograde, kind of the backwards way of going about things, it uses dianin. Dianin is the specialized protein. And what's important or the takeaway is that viruses are able to use retrograde transport. So um, a lot of different viruses, one that you typically might think of is HIV, for example, but basically it's able to use this retrograde transport in order to essentially infect the cell body of neurons. This is definitely important. Um, honestly, the sad thing is any picture that he puts on his slides is pretty much fair game for the test. So the more that you start going through and being comfortable with identifying, um, the more important it is. Um, the function of missile bodies, I don't think it's important quite yet um, for this test. So I am going to maybe just not cover it too much, only because I don't want to give you guys more information than what's necessary. Um, they do have basically some rough endoplasmic reticulum. They do have ribosomes in them as well. So they are part of like the protein making machinery. I'll kind of leave it at that. So just remember like axons don't have missile bodies, but both dendrites and the cell body have missile bodies. That's basically what's important for making proteins. Um, and I think he gets into it a little bit more, but I don't think you have to know it quite yet. But that's basically what, what they are. Um, let's see. So with this image, for example, um, let me look at this question real quick. What is a good way to tell the difference between the appearance of microtubules and neurofilaments if you ask a question for a D? Well, okay. Um, good question. And I think... If we get, so Dorothy, if we get to a picture that shows it better, um, I will show you how to tell the difference. I will be honest, from what I remember, I believe he told us he would never expect us to differentiate between microtubules and neurofilaments, because like in this picture, they look the same to me. Um, and let, if I can find a picture in this uh, PowerPoint that looks a little more um, identifiable, I'll give you some tips, but from what I remember, he didn't expect us to have to know how to differentiate between them just to generally know that they're there, if that makes a little bit of sense. Things that are very important for identification is like myelin, because as you can see, this myelin is very obvious. So basically this section here would be an axon and this would be myelin covering the axon. And then kind of the way, like, let's just say for whatever reason you couldn't figure out it was myelin, you might look in the center here and see what else am I seeing here? Am I seeing a nucleus? Am I seeing a nucleolus? You know, other things that you'd expect to be in certain sections of the neuron. I personally find the easiest thing is to be able to identify the myelin. So right away, if you see this very thick band or circling completely around something, go ahead and assume you're looking at an axon. Um, you might not know if it's a uh, something in the peripheral nervous system versus central nervous system, but you for sure know you're looking at an axon of a neuron. Um, this 100% was on our test. Um, and I will tell you, it was right here that was um, labeled. And I only remember this because this was one of those questions that for whatever reason people like were really mad about. I don't, I'm not sure why, because it seemed pretty straightforward to me. Basically, he had this section labeled, and this is the initial segment. So if you go back to this section here, C, which corresponds with this section on the neuron, is the initial segment. So basically what you should do, take this picture and be able to, for each of these different things, identify on this picture what you're looking at, or at least identify what he uh, labeled on this image. So he has A labeled, which is your nissel body. So you can kind of see this like more dense, very small circular thing. This would be like your um, nucleus, your nucleolus, very condensed here. So you can assume that you're probably here looking at the soma, and then this is the axon. So um, this B portion is your axon hillock, which is just basically the start of the axon. And then a is your initial segment 
or I'm sorry, C is the initial segment, disregard this A down here. And then here's just another way. Again, he's just showing you how he'll take, because you won't, in his section, you're going to get histology slides. You're not going to get cartoons for the most part. So just make sure you can kind of go between both. Um, D is showing you myelin and specifically the internodal segment. And then E is showing you, oops, way too far there. E is showing you a node of Ranvier. Um, a node of Ranvier is basically where on the axon, and it shows you here, right in between these little sections of myelin, there's no myelin. And so basically this is just the axon not covered by myelin. Um, and then you have the um, internodal segment, which is just referring to the segment of myelin on the axon. And then this is just another way, again, to look at the same thing. So this is multiple neurons kind of squished up into one histology slide. And then if he had this labeled, this would be the node of Ranvier. So that just kind of hopefully gives you an idea. Um, this would be like an internodal segment, for example. Okay, so this, um, again, just another, just to help you get a feel for how the PNS and CNS is organized. Um, this part, because, like the functional section, is really important when you talk about cranial nerves. Right now, more so what we're talking about is the structural setup. So it's kind of unfortunate that structural and functional is different. When we talk about your CNS, nuclei and tracts are in your CNS. So tracts are things that are um, in your spinal cord. And when we talk about different pathways for like sensation or for pain, they'll be traveling through tracts. Your peripheral nervous system has ganglia and nerves. So like spinal nerves, um, things like that. And ganglia are typically areas of synapse, just to give you an idea. So this is now definitely, like I said, a lot of these pictures are fair game. So if you see something like this, this is a peripheral nerve. So to me, it sort of looks like muscle, but we're not in the muscular section. So you can go ahead and assume it's peripheral nerve if it looks like muscle. And then a posterior root ganglion, this is just what it looks like. So if you saw a picture like this asking you if this was PNS or CNS, you know that this is a posterior root ganglion, so it would be PNS. Um, okay, so this stuff um, in embryology always seems to come back to haunt us all. Um, I don't know of many people who enjoy this, but he keeps it pretty simple, um, and kind of your takeaway, I would say, is that ectoderm is what makes your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. That's the biggest takeaway. You're not necessarily going to get tested on mesoderm and endoderm. And he probably even says that, that the focus is ectoderm. And, of course, the focus is neurulation. So I want to say, I feel like we've more recently talked about um, talked about some of this. So hopefully this, this is some refreshing information. But some things to take away from this slide. Remember that the notochord comes from mesoderm, which is different. But the notochord is needed in order for ectoderm to differentiate. So if you don't have a notochord, you can't have ectodermal differentiation. And what does the ectoderm differentiate into? Neural ectoderm, neural plate, neural groove, and neural tube, which eventually all gives rise to the PNS and the CNS. Um, a unique thing is, remember those neural crest cells? So that arises from ectoderm near the neural tube. So here and here, is, you're supposed to assume, because you obviously can't see the individual cells. Neural crest cells arise from here, um, and they um, give rise to a lot of different things. The main thing here is that the neural crest cell gives rise to the peripheral nervous system. That's definitely something to know whereas the neural tube gives rise to the CNS. If you remember, the peripheral nervous system, ganglia, and spinal nerves is kind of the main, the main thing for the peripheral nervous system. And another way to look at it is basically every other nervous system cell 
aside from the brain and the spinal cord is PNS. And that basically is all created from neural crest. Whereas CNS, neural tube, that's brain and spinal cord. Okay. So these are different glial cells. Remember I said glial cells have the function of supporting either the peripheral nervous system or central nervous system. So basically what should you take away from this slide? You should be able for each glial cell to know what its functions are. So oligodendrocytes, we already said, myelinate the axons in the central nervous system. Epidymal cells line the ventricles and are important for CSF creation. We have neurolimocytes, which are also called Schwann cells. So they myelinate axons in the peripheral nervous system. Um, we then have astrocytes. Um, like I said, they have, they have numerous functions in general, but they're extremely important when it comes to the blood-brain barrier. We have microglia, which are kind of those immune system type things. Um, or it has immune system type functions. It also is important for phagocytosis. And then satellite cells, which I don't think we talked about, but they're just more of a supporting type cell. That's about all you have to know about them, but it is specific to peripheral neurons. And now he goes more into each type of glial cell and how to identify them as well. So for oligodendrocytes, I don't, let's see. I don't, unless I'm blind. Oh, okay. Oops. Okay. So essentially this small section here, we see myelin, we see kind of this branchiness. You're supposed to assume that that's an oligodendrocyte and that oligodendrocyte is in the central nervous system and it's myelinating the axons. Um, and then these are just different things to maybe help you identify. It has multiple internodal segments on multiple axons. Um, this is sort of like just a clinical pearl. I don't know if it's necessarily as testable, but in multiple sclerosis, which I'm sure you guys have heard about before, it's where you have demyelination of neurons in the central nervous system. So oligodendrocytes are not working appropriately, and so we don't have myelination of the axons in the CNS. And then treatment is interferon, and it, it diminishes the immune response, because typically what happens too is that it's kind of like an autoimmune disease where our body attacks the myelin of our axons and gets rid of it. So astrocytes, that's the one that's involved with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, if you were to have to identify it, astro means star. So think of cells that look like stars. So these all have really branched um, kind of stringy projections from it. So just think of a star. Um, and these are those little um, processes or dendrites coming from the cell body. Here are some of the functions. They regulate the ionic environment of extracellular space. Um, they are important for brain development. Um, they're important for basically forming scars. Um, and they're important for maintaining blood-brain barrier. But these are affected in patients who have glioblastoma multiform, which is a type of cancer that is a very poor prognosis and is fatal and does not have an, a treatment at this point. So if you were asked a question about what type of glial cell is associated with glioblastoma multiform, you should be able to say it's astrocytes. And this is just giving you yet another picture of how you might be able to identify it. Um, for epidymal cells, look for, to me, this almost looks like simple squamous epithelium, to be honest, um, like lining a lumen. Um, so look for that when specifically you are trying to identify epidymal cells. Um, what else here? Microglial cells, they have that important immune function. To me, they look similar to astrocytes, but the difference is astrocytes their projections are smaller, like thinner, and they're more numerous. So that's how I would tell the difference between a microglial cell versus an astrocyte. And then you have a neuropil, which is a meshwork of processes of neurons and glia and gray matter of CNS. So it's just kind of like culmination of uh, neur neuronal processes. It's not like anything super, super special, but 
Uh, and honestly, I don't think you'll really have to identify this. Um, it's probably very low yield. And then Schwann cells, they're in the peripheral nervous system. We already know that it myelate, myelinates the uh, peripheral neurons, or excuse me, the peripheral axons. And then um, basically, so this was, this is I think the exact same photo that we saw earlier of a peripheral nerve just changed into a different orientation. These nuclei that we see are actually the nuclei of the Schwann cells. Um, so that's how, if you got an image that was pointing to these little nuclei, it's likely asking you a question about Schwann cells. And then we have those um, PNS, PNS satellite cells, which are just supporting cells. You really don't have to know a whole lot. Here's the takeaway though, is I do remember this being important and maybe it's not even for this test. Maybe it comes back in the next test or the test after, but a sensory ganglion looks different than an autonomic ganglion. So a sensory ganglion has many of these um, axons in it uh, compared to a autonomic ganglion. An autonomic ganglion is talking about something for like the peripheral nervous system, or excuse me, for the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, I don't think it's crazy important quite yet, but it'll come back. And then, excuse me, the, the satellite cells are these little circular densities. Not really much else to say about them. And then this is just showing you yet again, um, but when we're talking about glial cells specifically, what sections of the um, early embryonic portions of ectoderm turn into these glial cells. So the neural tube creates oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and epidymal cells, and the neural crest creates Schwann and satellite. Don't overthink this. Schwann and satellite are with the peripheral nervous system and neural crest creates everything in the peripheral nervous system. Same thing with central nervous system. Neural tube creates all of the central nervous system and oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and epidymal cells are all in the um, central nervous system. Okay, so actually it does come back. So I was remembering that correctly. So here's more about sensory ganglia versus autonomic ganglia. And here's the picture again for it. So we had one question about this. Um, essentially the way it kind of worked out to be is I think he showed us one of these images. Let's just say for example's sake, he showed a sensory ganglion. And rather than it being simply identifying, I think we either had to say, what type of um, neuron does it have? So sensory is pseudounipolar, autonomic is multipolar, um, and then maybe whether or not there were synapses. These two right here, neuron density, higher and satellite cells are greater. That's just to help you be able to identify which one is sensory and which one is autonomic. Kind of the main thing though is he, he might ask you whether or not it's sensory or motor, what type of neuron it is and whether or not it has synapses. Um, the takeaway here, so for each peripheral nerve, um, there is connective tissue that surrounds it. This should look similar to the connective tissue that surrounds muscle fibers, but you have an endoneurium, you have an, a perineurium and an epineurium. And basically this is the most internal all the way out to the most external. So what you should be able to say is basically for the type of murium or con connective tissue, what does it surround and what kind of connective tissue is it? So for the endoneurium, which surrounds individual neuron axons, it's loose connective tissue. But for the perineurium, it surrounds nerve fascicles, and that's a dense regular connective tissue. And then an epineurium surrounds the entire nerve altogether, and that is dense regular connective tissue. Um, and you may or may not have to do that from an image like this. So for example, P is identifying perineurium. I'm trying to see what else. E is uh, epineurium. And then around each of these little things would be endoneurium. 
So make sure you can do it with a histology image, because again, he probably won't give you a cartoon. And this kind of shows it well to um, the different types of connective tissue. So you'd have connective tissue around each of these little axons, you'd have connective tissue around this whole thing, and then you'd have one around all of it all together. More ways of looking at it. Okay, um, let's see. This is just more about the myelin sheath. So it could be talking about myelin sheath when it comes to peripheral nervous system or central nervous system. They are essentially about the same. Um, we already know this. We know what cells create it. We know that there are internodal segments, which is basically these. And then a node of Ranvier is where there is no myelin. And now this is just, again, reiterating what these different images look like. So a juvenile is basically an axon that has very early myelin uh, deposition. And then an adult or more matured version, you see there's a very thick band of myelin. And then this is showing you how to identify whether or not it's a Schwann cell versus an oligodendrocyte. So in this case, you can see individually, these little dots here are axons, and this surrounding each of these axons is myelin. So there actually was a image very similar to this on our test, except it was black and white. And I literally sat on this question for a good 10 minutes at the end of the exam, trying to figure out what the heck I was looking at. I think I did finally come to the conclusion that this was an axon and this was myelin. Um, and that it was specifically Schwann cells. And the reason you know it's Schwann cells is because the Schwann cell surrounds each individual axon, um, giving you this kind of appearance. Um, yeah, and I, that's, I think, what the question was asking. For unmyelinated axons, they're enclosed by invaginations of the plasma membrane of Schwann cells. Um, let's see if I can... I don't think you'll necessarily have to identify that. Let me see. Okay, actually this is pretty easily identifiable. This is a good picture to look at. So unmyelinated versus myelinated, um, don't overthink this. This thick band surrounding this, it's myelin. Um, this, where you have all these different axons that kind of look like they're being squashed up all together, those are unmyelinated. So look for very dark, thick bands, and that's myelin. And this is another way to show you the difference. Clearly, this is going to be a test question because it's being reiterated so many times. Now, something that I don't want you to miss out on, too, that is absolutely testable is the fact that um, A is pointing to the basal lamina around this axon. You should know what type of collagen it is. So it's type four collagen. Whereas the endonurium that surrounds uh, basically here, the whole section or multiple of these guys is made of, and my thing is covering it right now, but type three collagen. So you do need to know Basal lamina is type 4, and denurium is type 3. We had a question about that. Um, I don't think it goes into this too much because it, it's a little bit later in other lectures. But your neuromuscular junction is where you have a neuron that is synapsing onto a muscle fiber. Um, typically, the neurotransmitter that is released is acetylcholine, and this is just showing what that neuromuscular junction looks like. Here's another image of it. And yes, this is something you should be able to look at and identify on the test if you were to see it. Same thing here. This is all a neuromuscular junction. I'm trying to think about this. I don't think, hmm. I honestly cannot remember if we had to be able to identify what kind of synapse we were looking at on the test, but I would still make sure you can identify. So if you happen to see um, 
basically the ends of a neuron synapsing with the cell body. That's axosomatic because axon is uh, synapsing with the soma. Then you have axodendritic, where you have the dendrites that is synapsing with the axon. And then you have axoaxonic synapse, where both axons are synapsing together. So I, I could see him actually putting a picture on the test. And I think if you know what a neuron looks like, I think you could get it right either way. Because it's just simply using the words tell you exactly what's synapsing. Um, Takeaway here, positive and negative. So positive means it's excitatory, negative means it's inhibitory. So I would, not that it's maybe as testable right in this moment, but I think it is testable at some point that glutamate is excitatory, dopamine is both, serotonin is both, GABA is inhibitory. And then dopamine and serotonin can be both, basically, is what positive and negative means. Um... This is just showing you all the different ways that a synapse can look. And I guess here is a good example of axoaxonic synapse. Um, personally, I still kind of find it a little difficult to understand. Um, but this one is an example of axoaxonic synapse. This is axodendritic synapse. So if you know that at least the pictures that he puts in here, you should be OK. Um, and the way to know whether you're looking at a postsynaptic um, portion of the neuron or presynaptic is there's always a greater density on the postsynaptic side. So you know that this side right here is postsynaptic because there's a greater density or it's darker in color. And then this, I highly recommend using this as you study and basically Xing off as you feel like you have learned it adequately how to identify um, each one of these different things. Okay. And then the last one for today is biochemistry of the brain. Um, so this is a different instructor than we had, but comparing the lectures of my instructor and this instructor, it all looks about the exact same. So um, I don't think there'll be much discrepancy there. So this one is talking, obviously it's biochemistry of the brain, but a big part of this entire lecture is the blood brain barrier. Um, so this is talking about important things within the blood brain barrier. So the first thing is we have tight junctions, which form between endothelial cells, create, and they create a high resistance to paracellular transport. We also have selective transport, which is really important for the blood-brain barrier so to selectively allow what comes in and out of the brain. Um, and things that are luminal, uh, or if it's called like a luminal carrier, it's on the blood side. And if it's called an abluminal, it's on the brain side. So this is the brain side. This is the blood side or luminal side. Obviously, you know what an enzyme is. Um, and then efflux from the brain is restricted mostly to waste. Efflux meaning things that leave the brain. So things that leave the brain is really just waste. Um, this is probably important. So the luminal membrane facing the bloodstream, so this luminal membrane, is more permeable and less selective than the abluminal. So basically more is able to traverse this luminal membrane but when it comes to the abluminal membrane, the brain is very selective. So you have a lot of options for the brain to take in different things, but the brain is very selective on what it actually allows into it. Hopefully that kind of makes some sense. Definitely you need to know the barriers of the blood-brain barrier. So specifically what makes up the first barrier versus second versus third. So the first barrier is made up of endothelial cells of capillary walls. The second barrier is the basement membrane of parasites or pericytes. Um, and the third is astroglial end feet that cover 90% of the ab luminal vascular surface. So for this first barrier here, it is made up of endothelial cells. These cells are the cells that create the primary barrier using tight junctions and selective transport. So for each of these types of barriers, you should know basically what do the different cells use to create it? So tight junctions and selective transport is what the first barrier uses. For the second barrier, it is mainly produced by these pericy pericytes, 
which is this cell wrapping around the endothelium. And you can actually see it nicely here. These little guys right here are pericytes. Um, they support the formation of the blood vein barrier postnatally, so after birth, and they regulate the tight junctions of endothelial walls and vascular vesicular transport. And it makes sense to me at least that they would regulate the tight junctions of the endothelial cells because they're attached to the endothelial cells. Um, and that research indicates that a decrease in the number of parasite, pericytes increases the permeability of the blood brain barrier. So they are important for um, limiting what's able to come through the brain. And then the third barrier is these astroglial infeet of these astrocytes. Um, this is known, so this barrier here is known as the glial limitans, which is important. Um, and I think that's the main stuff here. Um, other important things to take away from the blood brain, bar blood brain barrier, it's pretty much almost completely sealed, except for a couple areas called circumventricular organs, which basically allow the brain to sense when things are in the body and they shouldn't be. So toxins, fuel molecules, peptide hormones, um, or not necessarily things that shouldn't be there, but maybe hormonal regulation um, as well. And then additionally, um, it's not a completely sealed off thing because we need to be able to allow for hormones from the brain to exit. So the examples are area pro, uh, postrema, which is important in vomiting. So I would associate those two together. You also have glucose sensing, so it allows the brain to determine what are your glucose levels um, because the brain absolutely depends on glucose. And then your hypothalamus is important for hormone secretion. And then you have, or regulation, um, then you have your secretory organs, the pineal gland, which is important for sleep, posterior pituitary, which makes hormones, and median eminence. Um, so takeaway, some of the takeaways here is that ultimately glucose is the um, is absolutely needed for the brain. The brain cannot survive without glucose or there will be detrimental outcomes. So the brain has a lot of mechanisms to ensure that glucose is transported into the, into the brain. So even when you're at a hypoglycemic level, glucose is still able to go to the brain because of some of these glute transporters that we have. So for example, um, GLUT1 is high in astrocytes, which makes up the blood-brain barrier, and endothelial cells, which also makes up the blood-brain barrier. They have a low KM. If we go back to enzyme kinetics, um, a low KM means it has a high affinity. If it's a high KM, it has a low affinity. So a low KM means that this transporter has a very high affinity for taking up glucose. Um, and then GLUT3 is high in the actual neuron, which again also has a low KM, so it has a very high affinity for taking up glucose. Particularly, it has a preferential uptake during situations of very low blood glucose. Fatty acids, when it comes to the brain, are important for structure. They're not necessarily as important for energy as they are for the structural composition of the brain, particularly omega-3s and omega-6 fatty acids. Amino acids um, are transported by selective transport systems, and certain amino acids are restricted in the brain because some of those amino acids act as neurotransmitters. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit more about ketone bodies, lactate, and a few other things in a couple of slides. So you definitely should know for each of these GLUT transporters, where are they located and what is their KN? Or in other words, what is their affinity for glucose? Is it high or is it low? Um, and then in general, all of these GLUT transporters are passive mediated transporters, so they do not require ATP because they work with the concentration gradient. So they take glucose from high concentrations to low concentrations so that ATP is not needed. And then this is showing you, and it already said in a previous slide, but astrocytes and endothelial cells have GLUT1 transporters. Neurons have GLUT3. But the commonality between all of these is that each of these transporters have a low KM or high affinity for glucose. 
Um, and this is super important. So uh, maintaining glucose flux in the brain. So normally our brain has a very specific ratio of glucose um, in the brain compared to blood. Normally, basically plasma or our blood has a higher level of glucose than our brain because that allows for glucose to move down its concentration gradient. So this is usually maintained when we have normal blood glucose levels or when we're hyperglycemic. The problem is when we are hypoglycemic and the glucose utilization in the utilization in the brain is now greater than the amount of glucose that you're getting. And that's why it's important that all three of these endothelial cells, astroglial cells and neurons, all have a very high affinity for glucose because the little amount of glucose that the brain will get in hypoglycemic states will be brought into the brain because of the fact that all of these transporters have a low KM or high affinity for glucose. Um, not too much pat, uh, like clinical pathology stuff in these um, slides, but this is one of them. If you have a GLUT1 deficiency, so if you don't have the GLUT1 transporter that's on your astroglia or endothelial cells, um, that's very bad because basically you can't get uh, sufficient amounts of glucose into the brain. We know that your brain has to have glucose, so this results in things like seizures, microcephaly, intellectual disability, developmental delay, motor and speech problems. The way that this is counteracted is from a ketone diet because your body or your brain can use ketone bodies for energy. Um, it's kind of like a second best option to glucose, so it at least helps reduce some of the symptoms, but it will not um, cure it. And then this is just talking about the different ways we can scan the brain. I kind of think this is a little less testable. But in vivo brain imaging is where neural signals causing a local increase in brain energy metabolism can be used to map neural signaling. And then you have PET, positron emission tomography, um, which uses radio labeled tracers to localize and measure certain glucose fluctuations. Um, and then also uh, fMRI or functional MRI uses blood oxy oxygenation. I don't know why I couldn't say that and flow to measure metabolism in vivo. So most of these different brain imaging uses metabolism and glucose utilization as a way to measure neuronal signaling. And I already have this marked here, but um, out of all of the following, which are, um, which are false. Let me turn off my notifications again. So GLUT1 enables glucose uptake at very low glucose concentrations. We know that's true. GLUT3 have a high affinity. Another way you could say that is a low KM, um, a low KM for glucose than compared to GLUT1. That's true. During hypoglycemia, the brain relies on fatty acids for ATP production. That's not true. It still relies on glucose. Um, and that's the main thing that the brain needs. Glucose does enter the brain via passive transport, and then ketone bodies can be used for energy production, decreasing the reliance of the brain on glucose for energy. That is true, but again, glucose has to be available, or there will be significant neurological deficits. So there are different ways that fatty acids are transported in the brain. There's a passive way and a facilitated transport. The passive way happens for short or medium chain fatty acids, so smaller fatty acids. Facilitated diffusion happens more for very specific types of fatty acids. Both mechanisms are used. Um, this is, I guess, the important point here is that the brain can perform some synthesis of non-essential fatty acids and fatty acid recycling, but the fatty acids in the brain are not used for beta oxidation. Remember, beta oxidation is a way to use fatty acids for energy. The brain does not use fatty acids for that. The brain uses fatty acids for structural purposes. So the brain can only use ketone bodies and glucose for energy production. So omega-3s and omega-6 fatty acids are polyunsaturated fatty acids, so they're essential. So you need to get them from the diet. Your body does not make them. 
Um, they're abundant in neuronal membranes and are critical for normal brain development. So they must come from the diet and they have to be blood brain barrier permeable because if they come from the diet, that means they have to somehow get from the outside of our body to the inside of our body to our brain. So they have to be able to permeate the blood brain barrier. Um, and then efflux from the brain is limited. Efflux is just removal um, or leaving the brain. And remember, that's mostly limited just to waste. Um, so I think we said this a little bit earlier, but the uptake of amino acids is very selective and limited because some amino acids function as neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are really important when we talk about um, nervous system physiology. So most of our essential amino acids are transported into the brain via facilitated transport with LAT1 transporters. Um, these are some of the amino acids. You don't necessarily need to memorize these amino acids, just know what transporter takes amino acids into the brain. Um, transport out of the brain um, is done through sodium dependent symbols. So you should know what type of transporter takes amino acids out of the brain. Um, and these are particularly important when we talk about, talk about glutamate, glutamine, homeostasis, because glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And if you have a buildup of an excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, that can be a problem. Um, so much of the transport that occurs of amino acids is actually to remove excess from the brain. So that's the majority of the transport is getting all the additional neurotransmitter out of the brain. So transport out of the brain, remember, is through the sodium dependent SIM porters. Um, they transport amino acids out of the brain extracellular fluid, and they do so against a very steep concentration gradient. So I think this is talking about it here. So this is blood. This is from the brain. So they're going against their concentration gradient into the uh, blood. This is followed by facilitated diffusion across the luminal membrane of endothelial cells and into the blood. Um, so brain extracellular fluid is believed to contain only 10% of the amino acid concentration of blood plasma. So blood plasma has a ton of amino acids. The brain has very little. So you're going against the concentration gradient when you're trying to get rid of amino acids. So this is the whole reason why the body highly regulates glutamate in the brain. It's because it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, which means that it makes it more likely for depolarization to occur at the synaptic terminal. So um, that can lead to a whole lot of things, um, can lead to new gene expression. It could lead to um, basically things that you don't want or need to happen. Um, so you don't want an excess of excitatory neurotransmitters. Uh, glutamate receptors allow for sodium, potassium, and calcium all to enter. So it very significantly hyperpolarizes the cell, makes it very, very um, likely to depolarize. Um, and it's considered excitotoxic because it's so excitatory that it is toxic to the brain. The way that glutamate is removed, remember, out of the brain extracellular fluid is through sodium-dependent symporters and then also excitatory amino acid transporters as well. So this picture sums up very well. <clears throat> we have a tripartite, tri I don't know, pronounce it right, synapse that refers to three things, the presynaptic, the postsynaptic, and the astrocyte. So presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron, and astrocyte. So two neurons and one astrocyte make up this special synapse. And basically what this does is helps to highly regulate glutamate. Essentially, glutamate is packaged into these vesicles with this little V glute. After it's packaged into these vesicles, it can be released into the synaptic terminal here. This is little bits of glutamate. We don't want that excess glutamate to stick around and continue to cause excitation. So it can either be removed through these um, excitatory amino acid transporters that are on the astrocyte, which when the glutamate goes into the astrocyte, it's converted to glutamine, which is not excitatory. The way it's done is 
uh, or the way it's converted is through glutamine synthetase. Remember, synthetases require ATP. Or glutamate can come over here and be reabsorbed into the synaptic terminal and reused. So these are like the two ways that it's basically highly regulated. And then it goes through that here. So in the presynaptic neuron, you have these newly synthesized glutamate that is packaged into vesicles, eventually released here into the synaptic terminal. In the synaptic terminal, it can bind with the receptors here and allow for uh, depolarization of the postsynaptic neuron. Um, eventually, though, you don't want it to stay in the synaptic terminal for too long. And like I said, it's either two pathways for it. It can go to these excitatory amino acid transporters on the astrocyte, or it can go to the excitatory amino acid transporters on the synaptic terminal. And then that helps to keep it regulated because glutamate over here on the astrocyte will be converted to glutamine. Then it will go through this glutamine transporter back to the presynaptic neuron and then be converted back to glutamate. And it just continues on and on for a long time. And then this talks about it here. This is the glutamine synthetase, which does the conversion that needs ATP and ammonium. Um, glutamine is neutral, so it does not have an excitatory function on the brain. Um, and this is basically just what I already said. Neurons convert glutamine received from the astrocytes back into glutamate. They do so, what you should know is the, pro, is the enzyme that it does that with, glutaminase. Um, this enzyme does not require ATP. So you should know between the two enzymes which one requires ATP. And all of this is how basically glutamate and glutamine is kept in homeostasis. <clears throat> there are other transport mechanisms to still, if there's just too much, to get glutamate out of the extracellular space and into um, the cells by sodium-dependent symporters. Remember, sodium-dependent symporters are the channels that are able to get stuff out of the brain. So basically, these symporters leverage the high sodium gradient across the membrane to basically use that gradient to its advantage to get um, glutamine out of the body or glutamate. You can also transport glutamine into the endothelial cells through additional sodium dependent symporters. Um, but basically, this recycling is probably the main function, and then any excess or spillover can actually be removed from the brain either through these excitatory amino acid transporters or sodium dependent symporters. And then we have a clinical note here. If someone has hyperammonemia, which is something they might have due to liver failure, potentially from like alcoholism or something like that, it greatly affects their glutamate glutamine homeostasis, leading to cerebral edema, cerebral edema disrupted neurotransmitter signaling seizures, coma death. So it's very bad. So basically what happens is because you have all this excess um, ammonia, this ammonia is needed, if you remember, let's go back to here, this is needed for this glutamine synthetase. So basically when you have excess ammonium, it's going to push the reaction in this direction. So it's gonna make it more likely for glutamate to be converted into glutamine which you might think to yourself, why is that a bad thing? Well, the reason it's a bad thing is because when glutamine builds up, it causes increased cerebral, um, increased, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not intraocular pressure, but basically increased cerebral spinal fluid, um, increases the cerebral pressure, and that's why it can lead to seizure, coma, and death, all of these things. Um, Yes. And then this is all about, so which of the following is false regarding glutamate? So glutamate receptors are both ionotropic and metabotropic. That's true. Glutamine is more tolerable to brain tissue than glutamate. That's true because glutamine is neutral. Glutamate is excitatory, but if you have an excess of glutamine, that's also an issue. Glutamate is packaged into vesicles via the V-glute. That's true. It was really small in the picture. And then this is the one that's false because it doesn't have three neurons. It has two neurons and an astrocyte. And then glutamine synthetase is the one enzyme that requires ATP. 
And then the last little bit here is all about mon monocarboxylate transporters, which transport ketone bodies, lactate, and pyruvate. Um, so they are used for energy production in the brain, because if you remember, the brain can use ketone bodies for energy production. So mon monocarboxylate transporters are a family of H positive coupled symporters. And this is probably a good takeaway here is that their um, monocarboxylate transporter expression level is rate limiting for ketone catabolism. So basically you need enough ketones present. Basically these transporters are dependent on ketones. These ketones are dependent on these transporters. Let's put it that way. Um, Albert, I would say no, um, because they don't talk about inotropic or metabotropic um, at all. I don't even know when or where it talks about. Inotropic is refers to the fact that it's able to allow multiple ions to pass through it. Um, metabotropic, I think refers to it being similar to like a G-coupled protein receptor or something like that. But honestly, don't I wouldn't even worry about it because it's not talked about anywhere else. Um, OK, so last couple of slides here. So nervous system or nervous tissue is highly dependent on oxidative phosphorylation of glucose to meet high ATP demand. We already know that. We know that. Um, the nervous system depends on glucose for high ATP demand. And then of course, how do we metabolize glucose? We use glycolysis, TCA cycle, electron transport chain. Um, none of that's particularly new. Um, resetting of sodium and potass uh, potassium ion concentrations is dependent on the sodium potassium ATPase, which is the case for like the entire body depends on that to reset those ion concentrations. Um, and then mitochondria and monocarboxylate transporters are enriched around synapses to address local energy needs. So they're particularly high in areas where um, there might be more lactate, pyruvate, and ketone bodies so that those can be taken to the brain to be used as another form of energy to help with um, energy needs of the brain. But again, this is very, very clear. Exogenous glucose has to it is absolutely required for the brain in order to work. You can't only have monocarboxylates. Um, and then this just talks about basically how the nervous system can metabolize ketone bodies. The way it happens is the ketone bodies enter the TCA cycle as acetyl-CoA. Um, basically, you don't really have to know too much detail about that, but ketone bodies are converted into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is able to go into the TCA cycle then all of the electron carriers from the TCA cycle go to the electron transport chain. So ketone use by the brain is largely blood concentration dependent. So if ketones are present, the brain will use them. That's basically all that means. Um, ketones can inhibit glycolysis, um, increasing cytosolic citrate, which inhibits phosphofructokinase. I don't think you really have to know all of that because that's already was sort of tested in the biochemistry section. Um, but essentially, this amplifies the glucose sparing effect of ketones and prevents glucose from being needed because it's inhibiting um, glycolysis, which you need glycolysis to break down glucose. So it, again, reduces the need for glucose, but it's still an absolute requirement. And then the last kind of thing here is the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle hypothesis. So this is just like an idea of how the brain utilizes all of these monocarboxylates um, and how it might recycle them. So you have the excitatory signaling by neurons, which uses glutamate, which triggers increased glycolysis, which produces more ATP in astrocytes. Um, glutamate that is secreted by neurons can be taken up into the astrocytes and converted to glutamine, which we already know, uses ATP because it's glutamine synthetase, which does that. Um, overall, this increases the energy demand. Uptake of glutamate by astrocytes um, is a sodium dependent requiring the use of a sodium potassium ATPase, basically to reset those ions because it requires 
the sodium concentration gradient in order for it to work. So it needs the sodium potassium ATP to reset the ion balance, um, which again uses more ATP, further increasing the energy debt or demand. So the way basically these neurons compensate is the astrocytes then can produce lactate as a product of, I think, don't know what RA is, but of glycolysis. And then the lactate can then be fed to presynaptic neurons by astrocytes to provide increased energy for signaling activity. So basically, lactate can be used as a source for energy to help with all of the energy that's needed and used in the glutamate glutamine homeostasis. Um, and then lastly, uh, what I would take away from this is that if you were asked a question about where glycogen is in the brain, it's in astrocytes. Um, it's in a very small concentration, um, and it's basically just reserves for if the brain absolutely needs glucose. So it's independent of the fed and fasted state, um, and instead it's just dependent on the local needs of the brain in that situation. So that's, again, this helps with the fact that the brain absolutely has to have glucose in order to function. And that looks like that is it for today. Um, so tomorrow we will go through pretty much the remainder is Dr. Viejo's stuff. And then um, Dr. Tulo which his stuff is honestly like very straightforward. And I'm sure that he probably also gave you guys one of those objective um, lists that you can use as well for studying. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I'm not sure if you guys have any questions, but if you do have questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat. Yes, I do, but can I wait after everybody's leaving? Yes, sure, no problem. Oh, I don't take any nobody's time, thank you. Yep, no problem. Um, yeah, but I hope this was helpful for those who joined. I think I recorded it. It's still recording. I'm going to try to pause it. Uh.